sure hope you're doing marvellously well. Here we are back with another Thack Fridays, which apparently is frequently asked questions. I did actually have to ask because I didn't know what it meant. Please, as ever, subscribe, hit the notification bell down there and you'll receive a notification telling you that we have a new video up. Oh, of course, go to Produce Like a Pro and sign up for the email list. You'll get a whole bunch of drum samples, free multi-tracks, videos and all kinds of fun stuff. Bunch of free goodies. So let's get stuck in. The first question we have might seem really basic to lots of people, but I want to answer it because I get asked this in 15 different directions and 15 different ways. So let's get straight to it. Fantastic question, because it does seem like a very obvious question, because of course, if you have an IO, they come with mic preamps these days. Sometimes they have one, sometimes they have two, sometimes they have eight, sometimes they have more. And yes, technology is moving fast. It's moving rapidly. Now, I'm not gonna say one of those mic pre's on a very inexpensive IO is gonna sound exactly the same as your several thousand dollar, you know, tube slash 1073 or whatever. However, it's gonna come pretty darn close. I've watched many videos and I've read tons of different reviews where people have done blind tests on mic preamps from a few dollars up to thousands of dollars. And in many situations, people have not known the difference. Now, there's gonna to be tons of professionals that are gonna be like, no, sacrilege. And yes, to a certain extent, you know, we all know that expensive mic pre's can add transformer weight, what is commonly known as warmth, but we're gonna call it weight. And that will give you that thickness. And we know that tubes in a really nice mic pre can add certain amount of distortion, which makes things sound more pleasant. But what comes in your bog standard inexpensive IO now is pretty darn remarkable. It is streets ahead of where it was at five or 10 years ago. So your little audience one or two input or whatever you have is going to sound absolutely fantastic. So yes, you don't need to use an external mixer. You might do if you want to submix. So let's just say you've got a drum kit and you're balancing it with a pair of headphones on your mixer. You've got like a four or eight or whatever, up to 24 channel mixer maybe. Yes, you've got all those mics going, then you might do a two track mix if your IO is only two inputs. Absolutely. Or more importantly, if it's only four inputs and you wanna go kick, snare, and then maybe stereo drums with the overheads, the room mics and the toms in it, that's quite possible. But otherwise, if you've got like a, at least an A input, you're gonna cover most drum miking situations. So no, you don't have to have a mixer. Is it nice to have a mixer with all those external pre's and EQ and compression and all that kind of fun stuff? Heck yes, it's great to have it, but you don't need to have it. You can now do all of that extra fun stuff inside of the mixer section of your DAW. There's so many incredible plugins out there that emulate vintage sounds if you want, or just give you incredible reverbs, delays, compressors, all kinds of fun things. The tape emulations that you don't have to have a mixer anymore. No matter how good the piezo pickup is in a bridge, it's always gonna sound different to a microphone. However, there are actually designs that have small microphones inside of the body, but they tend to point towards the strings and they do have a really good sound, don't get me wrong. But there is nothing better in my opinion than miking it either with a large diaphragm, say in the 12th or 14th fret. And we'll put a link here to how to record acoustic guitars. And also another trick that I love is the small diaphragm on the body. Now. Does that mean that you shouldn't use a DI? Of course not. Primarily DIs originally back in ye olden days of the, the very first like ovations and things like that that had pickups in them were designed specifically for live use where you could plug in and get a lot more control, less feedback, more importantly, less bleed from other instruments. Because putting a mic on an acoustic guitar live when the lead singer's moving around like this, you're gonna get tons and tons of bleed. So the DIs, predominantly were designed for live situations. However, 
My good friend Dave Jordan, who did Alice in Chains, and probably more importantly for this instance, the Jane's Addiction records, all the early really amazing Jane's Addiction records, would always take the DI out and put it through an amp. And he'd run effects pedals, and, and you get the most unique guitar sounds. Sometimes when you listen to those albums and you hear this really incredible arpeggio and you think, wow, it's so fat, such a big sound. That's because it's done with an acoustic guitar with heavy strings going through pedals into an amp and the amp's mic'd. So there's many uses for DIs. Also, he would mic the guitar and he'd blend. He did it with me when I was playing guitar for him. He would blend a, a recorded acoustic guitar sound with a mic with the DI going through an amp. Should you not use a DI to record with? No, of course not. I mean, you can use it. Is it gonna sound as natural and realistic as a microphone? No, but it can get pretty close. And there's lots of emulation plugins. There's lots of emulation stomp boxes that can help you. If this is the way that you want to make music, and more importantly, you wanna get an idea down really quickly, just plug it in. If it's gonna take you 10 minutes to put up the mic and put the headphones on and get it all figured out and find the right position, and you're just trying to get an idea down, you know, plug in the DI. Especially if you're in an environment that's kind of loud and noisy. Because the DI might pick up a little bit of reverberation of the truck ride, driving past your apartment building, but nowhere near as bad as having a mic on an acoustic guitar. Don't rule out using a DI, but if you do have a choice of a nice microphone, it's gonna give you the most natural sound. But DIs have lots of great uses. This. All right, what is it? It is, we're not sure. It's either a late 70s or early 80s Yamaha FG200. I had to look inside because I haven't looked inside in years. Why am I talking about that? It seems like a really good point to me because when I'm being asked about what's the one piece of equipment I couldn't live without, I make music. I co-write with my artists. I, you know, I play guitar on it. I play different instruments on it. But more importantly, getting away from that, my love of music is about creation, creativity of music. So if all of this was to go away today and you just left me with the acoustic guitar, I'd be much happier than being left with a microphone, even if it's $15,000. Okay, maybe I could sell that and buy more gear. But you understand my point. Take away the financial value, creativity is king. If it means that I can pick up the guitar and write a great song or practice some riffs and play along with one of my favorite albums, I mean, all of that stuff, that's creativity. And as much as I love microphones and compressors and EQs and amazing plugins and multi effects and stuff like that, the one and the single most important piece of equipment to me is that guitar because it's all about creation. When I'm working with an artist, I'm trying to get in there and get something out of them. I'm trying to get a performance out of them. I'm trying to get a great song out of them. I'm trying to get them to work on incredible parts to go over the song that they've written. That old Yamaha acoustic guitar is the one thing that I couldn't live without with all of this piece of equipment. I've used quite a few of them over the last few years. You've noticed that I've used the Scarlet by Focusrite, and I've been using, recently been using, the Audient. I love them both. I do like the Audient because I like the mic pre's because they have taken some of their more expensive mic pre's and adopted it into the very cheap units. Um, I like that because for me, for recording, I want to turn up at a situation with my laptop and just plug in a mic pre and record. When I was making an album, I had to go and do a choir and I just took a two input and my laptop and recorded the choir in stereo. And since then, I've been many, many situations, like if I'm traveling, all I need is a laptop and a one or two input device. Now, I like the Audient. I think the Focusrite is great as well. Uh, there's RME, there is UAD Apollo, which is obviously a, a little bit more expensive, but it's all of these different ones. I'm not gonna tell you you have to buy one or the other. I believe that these days, everything from like a Behringer at the lowest end, the most inexpensive up, right up to like the most expensive input IOs you can get, the Apogees and all of the wonderful things and the Antelopes and Lavery and all these great companies that makes incredible IOs. It just comes down to 
what are the feature set you want and what can you afford? But frankly, the technology has moved dramatically in the last five or 10 years that even the most inexpensive IOs now all sound good. There's been tons of tests um, that you can see online. You can go and read different things in magazines and they're all coming back with it's amazing how good the quality is in the cheapest of the cheap, cheapest sound cards out there. So now it's about feature set for me. It's like, what am I going to get? If you're going to get a little two input, has it got like a, a mic pre that has maybe a little bit of low end boost in it, some fullness? Has it got some saturation when you drive it? Is there some little features on it that are really cool? That's where I'm at now. So if you're looking at a little two input IO, start thinking about that. What's the feature set? Because I guarantee you those, the digital interfaces now are all of an incredibly high quality. So much better than when, when I started like 20 years ago with this stuff. So. What's the best one? The one you can afford that has the right feature set for you. That's my answer. The answer is yes. Just use the USB microphone. The reason why I say that is not that a beautiful U47 vintage one, you know, is not going to sound absolutely amazing and give you warmth and sound beautiful and full and all the wonderful things that we like to say about microphones. The reality is, it's like, if what you've got is a USB microphone and you have a way of plugging it into your laptop via USB and get to make music, that is absolutely fantastic. That is what it's about for me. Don't let budget hold you back. I know I talked about this, I think in my second ever video I ever did. And it was like the five key ingredients of a home studio. And one of them was like, don't let budget hold you back. Just if you've got a USB microphone and you're gonna start making music, then great. The reality is with cheap microphones, whether they be USB, whether they be, you know, just traditional microphones with an XLR cable on them, a condenser, a ribbon, a dynamic, it doesn't matter. Some of the issues with the inexpensive microphones is they just won't take the SPLs, the sound pressure levels. Meaning, you put it in front of a guy and you scream, it might just crap out basically, it might distort quite easily. It might not have sound pressure levels to be able to put on a drum or a heavy electric guitar. That's the only real downside with some of the inexpensive microphones that are out there. However, I have seen quality get higher and higher and higher. As we were talking earlier about interfaces, now microphones are incredibly good at the lower price points. My feeling at about the $300, if you don't want to go USB, the $300 price range now is it's crowded with a lot of amazing microphones. As you know, a few weeks ago, I got to use the Lewitt 440 Pure on a vocalist on David from the Workday release, and it sounded absolutely amazing. I was completely blown away by that. Okay, moving into this. We did recently just finish the vocals for Side by Side, the song that we've been serializing on YouTube. So, here's a bit of David singing. At the side of your eyes, I'm feeling at peace. At the sound of your voice, I'm falling in deep When you tell me you love me There's no sweeter song Say it again, darling And I'll sing along I am so sorry It took me this long to come home to you, my one true love Forever I'm yours now Forever you're mine Let's spend forever Side by side Forever together Starting tonight you can now download those vocal files. So go and download those. You can also get some new guitars. I did some new guitars and I think I may have replayed part of the bass line. Anyway, it's all there. Go and download the files and you can mix this song, you can do your own production to it, whatever you like. The vocal is here. 
description. So go and download it on that link down below. So thank you ever so much, everybody, for watching. I hope you had as much fun listening to this as I have doing it. I love these questions. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Give us your experiencing using interfaces and mixers and, and USB microphones. This is really good. I love this stuff because it's not just for the beginner or the professional, it's somewhere in between because as a professional, I travel places and I have to make music and capture music in many, many different environments that are not recording studios. And as some of the best records ever made were made in people's houses, in bedrooms, outside. You know, we saw that thing with Eddie Kramer was talking about recording acoustic guitars outside. You name it. Have a wonderful time recording and mixing. Please subscribe, hit the notification bell, go to producelikeapro.com, sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free stuff and I'll see you again very soon. Mm -hmm.